more about the, the quantum field theory. What does it say? Well, in my latest book, The Time Loops and Space Twist, I got into this whole notion of what is called the quantum field theory. And what, what physicists are discovering right now is so bizarre, it almost sounds like we're talking about science fiction and not really science anymore. What they're discovering now is that there seems to be a field that comes into existence when, now get this, when space and time both come into existence, and that this field is something like a field of mind. It's not a field of matter, but it's a field of mind. And that mind field has to interact or play with the light and space and time that came into existence at the time of the Big Bang. And in so doing, it starts to emerge something we call an orderly universe and a consciousness which begins to perceive it all coming out. So the book Space Time and, and, and uh, my book uh, Time Loops and Space Twist goes into just how does that come about? What's making, how does, how does the mind and how does that all come in together? And the current research right now is something called the search for the Higgs field. That's going on in your neighboring country of Switzerland at the place called CERN, uh, which is the facility for investigating uh, particle reactions at very high energy. They're looking for this field. They're looking for the particle of this field, which is called the Higgs, H-I-G-G-S field. And so I became interested in how does it all work? And the conclusion I came to, and this is what the book is about, is that everything literally is made of light. But light has two forms, two basic kinds of ways in which it can exist. One is the ordinary way that we see with our eyes, which, which we see when the sun rises or when we turn on our lamps in our room. That's light we see. But there's another kind of light which is a kind of funny, twisting, half-turning light, almost like watching a diver that dives and does a half-twist before the, she or he enters the water. There's a kind of, another kind of light which is doing half-twisting. And this half-twisting kind of light interacts with this Higgs field, and it zigzags back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, in such a way that it effectively seems to slow down. And when it slows down, it appears to have material substance. It appears as electrons and quarks, and finally, all of the material that makes up the whole universe. It all comes from this relationship of this field of mind and this funny kind of light twisting with the ordinary kind of light emerging from it as a kind of a messenger sending messages back and forth. So the whole thing looks like a kind of like a, a hologram, a gigantic hologram. And currently now, I mean, there, there was a show we had called Star Trek The Next Generation. I'm sure it, it must have played in, in France as well. And in when one of the, one of the uh, funny uh, shows had to do with a computer... Uh, they, they have a thing called the holograph room or the holo, holo room or whatever it's called. And uh, in that room, people could enter and suddenly the room is filled with, uh, with what seems to be a three-dimensional world in which they can interact. Could be, you know, they could be on the beach or they could be in the forest or, or climbing a building or whatever they're doing. Uh, and this particular character had decided to look at what is called Sherlock Holmesian kind of environment. And the character called Dr. Moriarty suddenly says, hey, I'm conscious. I'm leaving. I'm leaving this holo room. I'm not going to stay in this room anymore. And so he walks out and everybody says, you can't do that because you're just a creation of mind. You can't go out to the physical world because you don't exist. And he walks out into the physical world. And they say, oh, my God, mind into matter. Well, it turns out that the whole thing was taking place in the holo room. Even the illusion of walking out of the holo room was contained within the holo room. It was a holo room within a holo room within a holo room. And the guy who thinks he's doing all this eventually gets locked up into the little, uh, little kind of cube, which is uh, the end of the show. And we see one of the characters who's in the real so-called uh, uh, enterprise vehicle saying, ah, 
what are we going to do with the guy? Well, as long as we keep the thing on, he thinks he's living in real world, even though he's just a holographic projection. He, but he doesn't know the difference. And so as I was watching the show and the show starts to, to go off the air, the, one of the characters looks and starts to wonder himself about it and the show ends and suddenly I'm looking at the show, watching it on a box and realizing that the whole thing I've just seen has taken place in a box called my television set. And then it makes me wonder, well, what about me? Am I just in some great big other box? Mm -hmm. And the current thinking right now is that is what's going on that there are black holes and surfaces of black holes in space which are in which light gets projected into space and appears to us as real persons, real characters. The whole idea reduces to a thing which is so crazy that people think it, it's got to be insane, that there is no separation between people. There is no actual difference between you and I, even though you're in Paris and I'm here in San Francisco, we're really one mind in communication with each other, and we are all projections of that one mind, like holograms. And that's uh, kind of what my book gets into. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, the because I think you speak in your book about negative energy and, and what comes around goes around, and you're explaining this scientifically. Could you tell us more? We could not understand how the universe was created and how it works, if we only had quantum physics, we needed something else. And Albert Einstein in 1905 came up with something called the theory of relativity. And the theory of relativity is actually mind boggling for many, but it actually sets limits as to how far things can go. For example, it says that the speed of light is a fundamental limit and that nothing material can go faster than the speed of light. When you take that and physics and put them all together, you get certain kinds of limitations. And one of them is something about you can't get something from nothing. Um, uh, if you could make uh, particles which had negative energy, let's say, uh, then uh, it'd be possible to have another particle which has positive energy and that particle could give up all of its energy to the particle with negative energy so that it would gain energy but then the first particle would lose energy and if all if it could go down to any negative energy at all it could keep losing energy as it went down it's like thinking of a ladder when you're at the top of the ladder, let's say you're at rung number 20, then you walk down, and then you come climb down to 19, 18, 17, you come to rung zero. But there's rungs below that, minus, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. So if we have an infinite ladder, which is all the way up in energy and all the way down in energy, if you fall off that ladder and, there's, and there is negative energy rungs, then you could completely fall all the way down and you would, you would be giving off energy because there'd be so much energy that would come from that fall. So, for example, if you were to fall and hit the ground, big, big, big splash, if you could fall to infinite negative energy. So one of the things that came out is there can't be such a thing as negative energy because if there was, then the universe could collapse because everything with positive energy would fall into the negative energy hole and nothing would exist anymore. But Richard Feynman, another physicist, came up with the notion, well, maybe we're being too restrictive. Maybe it's possible to have negative energy if the particles can go backwards in time, which is crazy. I mean, backwards in time, what does that mean? Well, it turns out that if you put a particle and set it backwards in time with negative energy, it appears to us who are moving forward in time as if it were going the other direction forward in time with positive energy. So negative energy going backwards in time mm. appears as positive energy going forward in time. And when he came up with that idea, it became immediately clear that it was possible to have a particle go forward in time, suddenly disappear, turn around, go backward in time, disappear, and go forward in time again, kind of like the letter N, okay? And when it, dis when it went backward in time, how, what we, what, when it made the letter N, how would we see it? But we have to run our eyes up from the bottom from the letter N. We would first see two, we, we, we would see a V 
where the the base of the of 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 the letter N. Okay, we'd see a V, and there would be a particle going this way and a particle going that way forward in time, and then those two would come together at the top of the letter N, and they would collide and annihilate, and that would be creation and annihilation. So what we would say then is that the particle going backward in time is the same thing as an antiparticle going forward in time. So what we came up with is a notion that there has to be something called antimatter. Not only matter, but antimatter. Not only electrons, but positrons. So this is how the whole idea came about, all from the notion that you can't have negative energy going forward in time. But you can if it goes backward in time. So th th these are some of these ideas that uh, are written, I think, explained uh, as, mm -hmm. as well as I can in, in, in my book.